Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Metal Magdalene with Jet Right here on Metal Messiah Radio. Tonight, we have a special guest on the show. We have Ron Reiner of Dark Angel. Welcome to the show, Ron. Thank you for having me, and I'd like to start off by wishing you a very happy birthday. <laughs> I would sing, but I don't want everybody to change the channel right away. So I will probably leave that for the end of the show. Well, thank you for that. It's very nice to be able to spend my birthday evening with you, Ron. <laughs> hey, I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, this is awesome. My, my first birthday interview ever. <laughs> so, so Ron, okay, so you're from California originally, correct? Yes, that is correct. So what kind of music did you guys grow up listening to? Oh, man, I grew up listening to a little bit of everything. Um, actually, being raised in California was kind of a blessing for me because I got to grow up listening to, of course, uh, the, the Sabbath, the Montrose, the Led Zeppelin. Um, when I was in grade school for a couple of years, I have to put this on, and my sister Lori will call me out on it. I listened to Kiss while I was like, you know, 11, 12, uh, 13. Um, and then after, you know, that, I got into just the real uh, heavier side of things. I got into, you know, I discovered Led Zeppelin and Black Sabbath. Then I, uh, it was all uh, metal from them. I uh, discovered uh, Maiden and Priest and um, things like that. And it just kept going that direction. And when you were listening to all these bands back in the day, were you like singing along with them all? And did you already start starting to like kind of aspire to be a singer back then, Ron? It was funny. Actually, back then, I wanted to play guitar. Ah. And so when I was a kid, when I was a youngster, I started out as a roadie a Hollywood band called Video Noir back in the early days. I'm going to say probably 77. Mm -hmm. And I would go to Hollywood. I grew up on the strip like a lot of people in California. So I grew up on, on the, you know, Sunset Strip, Hollywood Boulevard, all those places. And uh, I met a guy named Harry. I was in the, um, probably it was called the Big Brother Program at the time, where kids um, on probation would, uh, get teamed up with the big brother to be a good influence on him. Mm -hmm. And what it was, is it was an excuse for us to get drunk on Sunday morning and go bowling <laughs> and talk about music. And uh, I started seeing a lot of killer bands like Yesterday and Today when they were, um, you know, Y&T when they were Yesterday and Today, the police when they were a punk band, um, Judas Priest at the Starwood. I just saw it. I started seeing a lot of really cool bands like uh, Motley Crue and the Wasp. Um, you know, in clubs, um, I seen Metallica open up for Armored Saint. And back then, um, in the 70s, well, that wasn't in the 70s, that was later in the 80s, um, uh, made in, uh, Armored Saint, of course. But in the 70s, I just wanted to play guitar. And there was at one point, I think I had like 10 or 11 guitars wow. at my house. The only problem was, is everybody I showed a song on guitar, Two weeks later was ten times better than me. <laughs> and after three years of guitar, um, I was horrible. Guys like Walt Drews were starting bands and playing in bands, and guys like Ronnie North were recording albums, and I still could not learn guitar. So I'm like, well, maybe I'll start playing bass. It's four strings. It's easier, right? And <laughs> I was horrible at that. And uh, I was singing at a backyard party to run this You know, so what were like some of your, not to sound too, you know, cliche or whatever, but what were some of your like biggest inspirations now as a singer, kind of developing yourself, wanting to be a singer? Who were some of your like singer gods? Well, 
back then, um, when I before I got into a band singing, um, I was in junior high, and a guy named Wayne had an import of Iron Maiden, mm-hmm. and uh, I was like, "What the hell is that?" So I never heard nothing like it. And he was like, "Oh, it's Rock Child Live in Tokyo." Mm-hmm. Like, that's cool. And he goes, dude, I just got this new one from Priest, and they're going to be coming out here in a couple of weeks. And we used to have a guy named Eddie Ray. We used to get all the concert tickets back from the Morrison days of Norwalk and from Norwalk High. He was like the guy at Fast Times of Ridden on High, except he wasn't a douchebag. He was like the coolest dude. He always <laughs> played guitar really good, always knew what all the concerts was. Like, dude, you got to go to Sabbath. And he said, you got to see Black Sabbath or never say die. And he was just that guy. And so he goes, yeah, I'm going to get a hold of Eddie Ray and we'll go see Priest. I'm like, sounds good, sounds good. Don't know nothing about him. You know, I was just like, yeah, yeah, sounds good. <laughs> you know, I like what I'm hearing. And so after I heard Maiden, I was like, okay, now I get it. Not only do I want to be in a band, but I want to be a singer. <laughs> and then we saw Priest, and I was like, yeah, I certainly want to be a singer, but damn, how in the hell is that guy doing that? <laughs> you know, it's like, because, geez, you know, help that brother, stab me, and yeah. me. And you're just like, holy crap, is that even possible? Because, you know, there was other singers out, you know, but now you're starting to find guys like, you know, Dio and Rainbow and, you know, Halford and Diano. You know, this is before Dickinson showed up in Number of the Beast. And you're just like, geez, this, there's so much you can do with vocals. You can just make people feel things other than just get up there and just make chick shake their butts. <laughs> you know, it was about really causing a, a reaction and, and an emotion and getting pissed off. You know, it was like this is an outlet for for what I feel, what I'm, what everybody else in my neighborhood. This is what we like. You know. For the kids riding the BMX bikes, riding the skateboards, you know, you find that metal in the punk wave and you're just like, oh, this is my home. This is the music I should have been into my whole life. So what were like some of the first bands that you were singing in then? What kind of bands were they? Uh, my first band was Messiahs. Mm-hmm. And uh, they didn't even have a name when I auditioned. They had a singer and um, they didn't have a name. And my cousin, like I said, he was in the band. And uh, they didn't even want me when I showed up. I showed up, I auditioned. And they're like, yeah, we don't even like that guy. He's kind of a jerk. Uh, you know, me and the guitar player, Matt Glover, um, didn't really get along. Me and Blair Good and the other guitar player, we got along. And they're like, yeah, we kind of don't like that guy. They didn't have a bass player. And my cousin was just like, yeah, if you don't let him in, I quit. He was a smoking drummer. <laughs> and um, it was just like, okay, well, it looks like we got a new singer. We'll fire the other guy. <laughs> and uh, two weeks later, my cousin just up and quit. Like, dude, I don't play drums no more. I'm like, what? <laughs> and so that kind of didn't um, pan out, but we ended up getting an amazing bass player and finding the drummer. And we just played, you know, basic heavy metal, you know, just that heavy metal. Iron Maiden, Priest, Armored Saint, kind of, you know, just that real pounding forward sound. Um, Dark Angel was kind of an uh, accident. My band was going to do a showcase, and um, me and my guitar player, Matt, kind of had a disagreement, and he's just like, dude, this, I, want, I want to be the guy in the band. I'm like, no, the band's kind of a band. It's not one guy. Mm-hmm.
this singer? I go, he's just doing one album and done. And he goes, no, oh, this is the same singer from We Have Live. I'm like, oh, no, it's not. He goes, yeah, it is. And so um, after listening to that, I was like, oh, yeah, I'm down with this. This, <laughs> this will be a new style for me to learn, but mm-hmm. I'm definitely into this. And um, I got up with the Jimmy, ended up uh, meeting him and Gene. Coming down, I went and hung out with the band for the night. We, I did an audition the first time. That was kind of an interview. And we hung out. We rapped all night. Um, the second night I came and I think I played three songs. Gene and Jim, Jimmy would remember the songs that we played. Gene for sure would remember that. He's got an identical memory of that. I mean, he would remember what we ate for dinner that <laughs> night. Um, you know he would. <laughs> um, and uh, we, we got along the first night like we did along today. It was just, it was so uncanny. It was just like one of those moments to where we meet, and the next day they were just like, you can be you're the guy who wanted to be in this band. We're, we're all in agreement. So it was what, like awesome. This is home. What was like your first show that you did with Dark Angel? San Francisco, The Stone. Wow. And how was that for you? Oh, it was awesome. And here's a fun little side note. Marty Friedman and Dan Loper rode up to San Francisco with us. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, my first first show, Dark Angel, like, yeah, I'm a bass player from Nuclear Assault, <laughs> Marty Friedman, like guitar freaking, you know, mm-hmm. just master, you know, and they're like, oh, yeah, here's some friends of ours, you know, they're going to ride up and go see the show with us. You know, I'm just like, oh, yeah, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I played like backyard parties and maybe like four Hollywood shows to my name at this point. But yeah, yeah, sure. Let's bring these guys too. Yeah, no big deal. <laughs> yeah, like you said, no pressure. <laughs> you know, it turned out they're both really freaking cool, and uh, Marty was super funny. Um, he ended up uh, um, being super hilarious and telling some really funny stories. Um, I had just gotten a cacophony um, cassette. I think I had it on cassette probably about maybe three or four months prior to that. And I was just like, dude, holy smokes, this is so freaking amazing. And uh, he, just his humility and how cool he was was really awesome. <laughs> so Okay, so like the first album you did with them, right, Leave Scars, very pivotal album for the band and you did a lot of touring uh even with death so tell us a little bit about touring touring with with death um it was unique for me it was my first tour ever (laughs) so i mean i was like total just came from a club band you know Mm -hmm. came from a club band my band my band actually just broke into clubs we were pretty much a backyard party band and our goal was always to get the cops called on us. We were just, <laughs> my band was nothing but trouble. Um, we were just the epitome of just young kids. So now you take Dark Angel, who is young kids unsupervised, mm-hmm. and you take them out with death. Well, you know, I don't have nothing bad to say about death, but Chuck was a really reserved individual, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, Rick and Terry really nice guys. I didn't really talk to the drummer that much. Not not saying nothing bad about him. He was, he was always cordial and nice when we spoke. Um, but uh, Rick and Terry were the, the two members of that that I mostly talked to. I talked to Chuck a few times. He was just kind of more uh, just uh, reserved mm-hmm. would be the word I guess I would use. Mm-hmm. Um, so we get out on the road and we're uncontrollable <laughs> and that's putting it mildly. <laughs> Because um, we're not doing crazy, like, we're not doing crazy rock star stuff. We're just getting drunk and psycho because we're, un- we're uncontrollable kids with no supervision. Right. You know, so, you know, we're not we're not doing Motley Crue dirt stuff. We're tearing apart stuff. We're doing what, we're breaking every law that we can. We've broken the freaking Disney World when it was closed. We didn't give a crap. We, we looked at it as there was no rules, there was no laws. We didn't really have any regard for anything or look at anything we were doing as wrong. So 
but we didn't really think that there was ramifications or anything <laughs> to our actions. We just thought, well, we're our kids, we'll just do whatever we want, and we're not really sure what's ours, so we'll just take everything. And that was kind of our mindset. We didn't really do it for any gain or reputation. We just thought, hey, this is pretty much fun. You know, our, one of our models of the Foodie Scars Tour, we drove ourselves for the first leg of that tour. And uh, our motto was, is we're going to drive till we can't drink anymore. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> and uh, we put that through the test several times. Um, we, when we bought the, we totaled one rider truck. Um, we totaled the RV when we brought it back to the rental yard. They just said this brand new RV is totaled. So, okay, so the band broke up, but got back together, broke up, got together. What was the reason for all these breakups, and, and why did you all finally get back together again? Well, we just took a hiatus. I think, personally, I don't think Dark Angel could have stayed together at the course we were headed to. Right. Because, I mean, there are certain times that you have just volatile behavior that people feed off of. And when nobody in the room has the ability to say no, it's not a good thing sometimes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's like there's, there's we were, I can't remember what city we were in, and Gene said something I'll never forget. He said, you know the old adage of, Bad publicity is still publicity, or, or there's no such thing as bad publicity because even bad publicity is publicity, something mm -hmm. like that. And he goes, I think we are proving that to be wrong. <laughs> and we were. Mm -hmm. Because there was just a time to where we were just getting in, just it seemed constant trouble every time we turned around, and none of us at that even when we were trying to be on our best behavior, could. I mean, I couldn't. There was a time to I don't even think I could stop drinking even in the morning. I mean, I'd wake up and I'd be like, oh, yeah, you know, it's like 8 o'clock in the morning. We should go get tacos and tequila shots. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's just, it was just, you can't run at 150 miles an hour 24-7, 365 days a year. And... I believe if we wouldn't have went on hiatus, there'd probably be members of us still in prison, and most of us dead. There'd probably only be a couple surviving members. And you were wrong. <laughs> you guys lived. <laughs> oh, that's why. That's why the hiatus was really important. You know, sometimes, and I can't believe I'm the one saying that would be saying this, but I mean, sometimes it is important to grow up and mature to a certain extent. That's true, and you know, in 2013, right, the band got reunited again uh, with you as a singer. So when reuniting this time around, what has the goals of the band been? Now that you're all adults and you got all that shit out of your system? Well, um, a, lot of, a lot of things that I think um, people don't realize is the whole time that we just weren't playing music together, we still always had, we still always were talking to one another. Mm -hmm. And we would still even see and visit each other. And so even when I was doing that band, Oil in California, or Gene was in Strapping, or Jimmy was in Dreams of Damnation, you know, Eric was in Swine, we would still, you know, visit each other, see each other's shows, um, just be... Um, in each other's lives. So, I mean, us just having that rapport, you know, with each other. I mean, I was at, uh, it's Gal I think it's Galaxy Theater at the time. I don't, I think it's called the Planetarium in California. And I sat with Gene's mom and dad, and we were just talking, scrapping this plane, and uh, we were just having the coolest conversation about the Fender's days, Fender Ballroom days. You know, and you know, Jerry said something about when I was, you know, 24. It's like, you know, right before you got married at 24, being a young kid. And, you know, and it was just, 
you think back at those times and all the history, you know, we cut our teeth in music together. Mm -hmm. So when we, in 2013, saying, oh, yeah, you know, we, we always talk about it. Every year, 2009, is this year we're going to get off our butts and do it? 2010, is this year we're going to do it? You know, it's like one of these years, we either need to just get up and do it or just put a press release out and say, you know what? Every time people see us together, we just enjoying each other's company and we're never going to do nothing together musically except just get together and, you know, enjoy each other's company as friends and don't, please don't leave nothing into it or get off our butts and just go play some incredible music and have fun together. And that was just, it was that time. We just all realized, you know, we're not getting any younger and we really just miss playing together. And I, I believe that when you see the videos, it's just evident that it's just so effortless for us to just do that. And I, I'm not saying it like effortless, like we're so good, it's, it doesn't take any effort. I mean, for us to cut everything out of our lives and travel, because all of us are in five different places. Right. So we all have to cut everything out and just go do homework at our separate places where we live. We only usually get about two or three rehearsals together, so we have to rehearse at home and uh, get together. And it doesn't seem like work. It just seems like, you know, everybody's all fired up just to, you know, get together and laugh for like four or five days straight together and have some fun and bang out some fast, aggressive music while we do it. And it just, you know, it just came together so organically. It's, you know, we had Gene on the show, and he was telling us about how the band has been doing some writing for a new album. So how has that process been going, and what what have, what have you guys completed so far? Well, I don't... The one thing that is super cool is now that everybody has smartphones, mm -hmm. you, can, you can hear stuff a lot easier. <laughs> like if Jimmy sends me a riff, or if Jimmy... Uh, and we, you know, everybody has portable studios now at their house. So that's yeah. the one thing that's cool. Or like Eric sent a, a, a little mini vid of his studio up and running again. You know, that makes everybody happy. So anytime somebody gets a riff, you know, and I always tell the guys that the heavier the is, the heavier I can sing. <laughs> you know, I, I love the fast stuff. I really do. And, you know, a lot of times we'll go fast and fast for it's just really choppy, aggressive vocal or heavy for grindy. And uh, so the last time we spoke about it, uh, you know, Jimmy had sent the riff, was talking about this riff that he had sent. And I said, um, dude, that sounds beautiful. I love, I love uh, the fact that you can hear stuff. And I love the fact that Eric's got his uh, studio back up and running. And, uh, yeah, Gene was saying that you actually had completed some songs and stuff. And uh, are you the sole lyric writer, Ron? Oh, no, not at all. So the whole, so the whole band writes for ly the lyrics? Uh, no. Um, Gene, Gene will write a lot of them. Uh -huh. And then uh, me and him will get vocal lines worked out to where it will sound the best with my vocals on it. And so I don't, you know, I don't I don't have to be I don't have to be the guy out in front on anything. I just want at the end of the day my goal is for the song to sound the best with my input in it. And so I want the vocals to be the best that I could possibly make them. And if that's with a lot of my input, then I'm cool with it. If it's with less of my input, I'm cool with it. I always like that. I always tell the band we're at rehearsals, you know, when I bang out stuff, it's like, you know, questions, comments, concerns. You know, I want, I always want my band to be stoked with my performance. Like when I hear them do a riff, or I hear them do something, how happy that makes me. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like Dark Angel's probably the easiest, hardest band I've ever been in. Because the music's not easy to play by, by no means. But, the band, how they approach everything has always been just effortless. You know, they just, everybody in this band has a really good work ethic. So it's like when it comes to us getting together, no matter how limited it is, we always seem to bang out a lot 
lot of uh, a lot of productivity in a short time. So, how many songs have you guys completed so far? Oh, I I don't know. <laughs> I I've seen about. I'd have to check on my phone on how many riffs that I have, but as for them getting the finishing touches on it, they're pretty picky. I wouldn't know how many they completed until I'm in the studio banging out vocals, to be honest. But you know as well as I do, that stuff changes up until then. Um, up until the last minute, actually. <laughs> so. Yeah, so I mean... I always, like I tell people when they're like, hey, are you doing this show? We heard you might be doing the show. I'm like, until we sign, until we ink the deal, we're not doing a show. Until I'm laying down vocals on something, that song's not done. So tell us a little bit then, I mean, so you guys definitely are writing, and, and you know, Gene's been telling us about it. I haven't had Jimmy on in a while, but the last time I had Jimmy on, you were thinking about it. That was like two years ago. So what could people, <laughs> would you guys get get together? And now you're writing this music that will eventually come out for all of us. What could we expect from you guys? I mean, are you still like in the old vein or, or, or what's going on? You got to tell us something. Give us something, Ron. Yeah, it's going to be freaking, I... For me personally, I would be I would be extremely hurt if my vocals weren't the heaviest thing on there and if the riffs weren't. Because every riff that I've heard so far was just makes me super excited. <laughs> and I mean, if you look at, I look at it this way, um, just the musicians, just how the band has grown as musicians, everything is just, I mean, gotten so much better. It's like when I when I look at when I look at um, just Jim and Eric live. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll watch videos and I'll sit there and just trip out on. I can't remember. I think it was. Uh, I think it was um, Lords of the Lamb. Mm-hmm. Almost the agony. They're sitting there riffing and they're just staring at the crowd riffing promise. <laughs> and not looking at their guitars, lights flashing, and they're playing Promise Agony, probably one of our hardest songs, and they're just, it's just nothing to them. It's just like, damn, this is how, how hard they work at that. And then you hear, like, riff ideas, or Eric, you know, us warming up for rehearsal and whatnot, and then running riffs. And I just imagine my vocals over or what I what I have ideas of floating around and Gons is based something through it. And you know, you don't have to sell anybody on jeans. It's like <laughs> you know, I I was doing an interview and, and uh, I think the guy the guy said uh, if somebody doesn't know who Gene Hoyland is, the guy wonders if that person even likes heavy metal. I'm like, yeah, I, I can see that. I, I agree with that statement. You know? And uh you know, I think to say it would be our heaviest album yet would not be an understatement. And now are you guys going to be... If it wouldn't be our heaviest effort yet, then I would be really depressed. Well, from what you're saying, it sounds like it is going to be, so I don't think you're going to have to be too depressed, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd have to... I'd have to or something. Yeah, no, no. So, are you guys going to be doing, like, any touring or anything at all this year? I know everybody's busy with all their stuff, but are you guys going to squeeze anything in? Um, we're, we're working on it right now. Mm-hmm. I can't say what it is. Right. Like I said, we haven't inked anything, but the minute, anytime we ink anything, we always try to put it on the internet. Right. In- you know, we, always try to, we always try to, via the Dark Angel official Facebook, mm-hmm. or, uh, And, 
And speaking, okay, so now that you guys are more mature and you're getting a little older and you have gone out on some tours, as you were saying, we saw some great videos of, of some of the tours that you guys are on. Um, so how do you, you know, keep yourself in shape now and keep your vocals up after all these years? Um, it's, I was just talking to Eric Meyer on the phone on my way home from work today, and uh, it's, you got to train totally different. you got to train and you got to rehearse totally different. Like uh, now, you know, um, like we were talking about a month ago or so ago um, with all the supplements that I do. You mm -hmm. know, it's like I work out, I work out, I do cardio, I, uh, I try to sing as much as I can. I do a lot of acapella now. I mm. try to sing by myself more so I can control my tone a little bit more so I don't push as much live. Um, I just try to stay in better shape and I don't, I'm not the party psycho like I used to be like before and when I was younger. I think my work ethic was, I rehearsed all the time but I think I partied harder than I rehearsed. <laughs> now it's the opposite. Um, I'm pulling into more like I'm in my studio right now and my studio has dumbbells from 5 to 50 pounds and a uh, body fit exercise bike, a mm -hmm. barbell curl bar and then it's got my monitors and my PA system and my progressive scan and all that other happy fun stuff to sing but it's got like all my workout stuff too so I can work out while I sing and I think now you just have to pick one what's more important to you. If you want the longevity to do this longer so you can, you know, keep up with the youngsters or if you want to just party and be crappy and only be able to do a 30-minute set or be able to, you know, if we, if we do 13 songs, 14 songs, that's an hour and a half Dark Angel set. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of singing. Yeah, Promise of Agony was, let me see, one, two, three, four. That's five pages of lyrics for Promise of Agony. Mm -hmm. I got it right in front of me. Mm-hmm. Kane's Invention is three, and that's a seven and a half minute song with seven minutes of vocals. Wow. So, so yeah, but it's, it's just, it's just different. And I think uh, the thing is now is when I was younger, I didn't really... I didn't really have that much humility. I thought, ah, oh, you know, I'll just yell and scream, and if people don't like it, I'll just throw stuff at them or flip them off or spit beer at them. And now it's just like, you know, I'm so blessed to be able to still have the opportunity just to travel and perform that it means more to me now. And now it's it's more of a conscious effort that I represent just not only myself out there, I represent my band as well. And this time around, too, Rana, the whole band is taking care of themselves. You're all in great shape now, and you're all, you know, uh, keeping yourselves together. I mean, I know you're all on the high on life, too. You're all, so I know you're all putting in good things into your bodies. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Whereas yeah. before, you were putting in all the beer and stuff. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I've been married for 30 years. I've been married longer than I thought I'd live for. <laughs> you know, 
I plan on being around for a little bit longer. And and that's because you guys are all mature adults now for the most part. <laughs> and, I know. And it's, taking it's, care of yourself. I never thought that I would, I would be the one saying that. <laughs> I know, right? You're so not used to that. But yeah, here you guys are still going in the band. And like you said, having a good time, you know, going to these festivals, having a great time. It really reflects when people watch it and hear you guys do. So it's a lot of fun for the audience to hear as well. And of course, we're all looking forward to new music from you guys before we all die. And hopefully, <laughs> you guys... Oh, you don't even know how much I'm itching to get into the studio. Do you, do you have tattoos at all? No. Okay, cause, okay all, the tat all the people with tattoos listening to your show will get this. So when you have tattoos, you always get the itch to get new ink. So you right. be like, man, I haven't got tattooed in a while. I need to get a tattoo. And so it's like a constant... You know, like me, I'm getting to where I'm running out of room. It's, it's like I always, I will look at a place and be like, man, I can't handle that. There's, you know, my body is driving me nuts. Being my own skin there, I need to get in there. Um, I will hear a Dark Angel song. Jose Magnum will play like a Dark Angel song or something on the radio. And I will be like, dang, I want to go in, in the studio. I want to go record something. And I get the itch so bad that on two, for like two or three days, I'll start watching videos on YouTube, or I'll start listening to the Archangel stuff, or I'll come in my studio and just sing a cappella for like two or three days, mm -hmm. or start just like singing the vocal lines and just writing stuff, because I just get that, that tingle, that itch of mm -hmm. just like, man, I want to, if I could just stop the world and make everybody do what I want to do, <laughs> You know, just make the whole world, put the whole world on wrong schedule. It would be just so bitching. It would work out like I want to. But you know what, Jeff? These people never listen to me. They never what do the what hell? I want to do. I'm like, look, all, like my work, I tell them, look, this is, you guys just pay me. I'll sit at home and get tattooed all day and do music, and they don't, they don't agree about it. Go figure, huh? <laughs> I know, bastards. <laughs> So, again, we're totally looking forward to that. And what sites did you say are the best sites for people to go to, to see Dark Angel stuff? The the Facebook Dark and the Instagram? Official on Facebook. Mm hmm And then we're on, um, we have Instagram. And then uh, I believe on Twitter. So I there don't you... know. I don't do it. I, Yeah, I, well, I, I there's just, a... I just, do, I just do the Facebook and the Instagram. <laughs> I don't do... Uh, I don't do, I don't tweet nobody. Well, I think that your Facebook is pretty up to date on what's going on with the band oh, yeah. and all of you guys individually, too, if you're doing something cool and if you have anything coming up, it's posted up there as well. And, Ron, thank you very much for coming on the show, updating us a little bit about the band, telling us a little bit about your career, and we hope to have you all back on once this freaking album is complete. That sounds awesome. Jeff, you know what? Thank you so much for um, interrupting your birthday for me. I appreciated it. That was very sweet of you. And I did promise to sing you a horrible version of Happy Birthday. Happy Birthday to you. Happy Birthday to you. That's all you get. <laughs> it's the Elvis version. <laughs> Well, thank you, and again, all the best to all of you guys, and we're patiently waiting for the new album. Thanks for coming on the show. Hey, anytime.